Chapter 10, Eukaryotic Chromosome Abnormalities and Molecular Organization of Those Chromosomes is what this video tackles next. It's a pretty comprehensive chapter with many, many sections, each dealing with different aspects of chromosomal structure and abnormalities. Let's begin by understanding that the number of chromosomes, as well as their shape, can vary enormously between organisms. And there's no rhythm or rhyme as to the number of chromosomes a particular species should have. Various other evolutionary forces can direct a species' genome in various directions. Regardless, there seems to be some similarity between closely related species because enough time has not passed for these mutations to accumulate. So humans and chimpanzees have very similar, not identical, chromosome numbers. One thing for certain is that within a chromosome pair of the autosomes, there is a distinct size, shape, and genetic content that is standard for that species. Table 10.1 nicely illustrates the chromosome number for a few species. If you look, you can see a human has 46 chromosomes per cell, and a chimpanzee has 48. A fascinating finding about chromosomes is that they are not scattered randomly throughout the nucleus. Each chromosome appears to have a location in which it settles down and then influences neighboring chromosomes to settle into their positions. These regions have been termed chromosome territories and they're very evident during interphase as indicated in figure 10.1. Different fluorescent dyes can now be used to label each interface chromosome to identify it uniquely from others. In this particular case, we have the nucleus from a chicken cell, and we can see that each chromosome inhabits a defined territory, with homologs being in different places. Just reiterating what we just said, the chromosomes do not occupy the exact same arrangement within the nucleus. So you won't find homolog one here and homolog two over here. Sometimes you might find it here and there. But there is a slight pattern to this madness in that once the chromosome has been given a territory, it tends to stay there and not leave until the next cell cycle. In addition, chromosomes are active within their territories. They can move around, they can twist, and they can turn during transcription and DNA replication. And the other thing is chromosomes appear to be anchored to their territories by their centromeres to the uh, nucleoplasmic proteins, the proteins that form the structure of the nucleus. Interestingly, more recent analysis has shown that there are interchromosomal domains between each territory. Uh, these are equivalent canals or channels that allow for movement of proteins, enzymes, and RNA molecules from within the mass of the chromosome doing its biochemical manipulations and their passage to various other locations, including nuclear pores. And finally, interestingly in itself, uh, the more rich gene chromosomes, those that have a high density of genes, are generally located near the center of the nucleus, with the smaller chromosomes with fewer genes being located in the periphery. Since the very beginning, Chromosomes and nuclei have been stained with various substances, but more recently, individual chromosomes have been visualized. Chromosome visualization takes place by using dyes or chromophores. These substances can be generic, sticking to all DNA equally, or very discriminating, adhering to DNA depending on its level of compactation, and even based on its sequence difference. Once chromosomes are spread out and stained, they can then be pictured, and the picture can be reorganized by a computer program to reveal a karyotype. So a karyotype is nothing more than a picture of the chromosomes arranged in a particular order, from the largest to the smallest, with the sex chromosomes of that species identified differently at the end, and of course, the karyotype may be from different types of staining experiments. In the next figure, we can see that this is a human karyotype where each chromosome pair has been stained using a unique combination of fluorescent labels. These six chromosomes are here at the end. In this particular karyotype, we have an X and a Y, therefore 
This must have come from a male. In addition to chromosome length, the position of the constriction, the centromere on a chromosome, may also be used to confirm identity. Chromosomes are normally divided into two. The short arm is known as the P arm for petite, and the long arm is known as the Q arm, as this next letter in the alphabet. So chromosome shapes are named based on centromere position. So we have to learn these, and there are four names. Metacentric means that the centromere is near the middle of the chromosome, as indicated here. So it's very close to the middle. Submetacentric means that the centromere is somewhere between the center and towards one tip. So this will be submetacentric. Then we have acrocentric. The centromere is close to the end. So acrocentric will be close to the end. And then finally we have telocentric. And in telocentric it's hard to see the P arm as it's very close to the centromere. And that's indicated right here. Metacentric, submetacentric, acrocentric, and telocentric. The use of these fluorescent in situ hybridization dyes has led to the ability to identify fine positions within chromosomes. The DNA probes, as they're called, the fragments that contain the fluorescence, are able to find quickly their target sequence within chromosomes and bind. Wherever they bind, they allow the detection of their fluorescence. Today, many, many different fluorescent dyes are available, each binding to a particular unique region of a human chromosome. In this panel here, we can see the technique is known as FISH. Fluorescent, because they do fluoresce in the appropriate illumination. In situ stands for inside cells. And hybridization means the combination of two nucleic acids to each other based on sequence. So these chromosomes are normally treated with a dye in place. Prior to applying that dye, the chromosomes are separated using various techniques so that we have single-stranded DNA. And then the probe is able to go in and bind to its complementary DNA strand. And then the photographs are taken. So each one of these colors is unique to that particular chromosome. In this panel here, we have an intact nucleus that's not the subject of this analysis. And just around the outside of that, we have a disrupted nucleus that has spilled its chromosomes into the environment. We can see here that the chromosomes are stained a background color of blue. But on top of that, we have two further colors. We have the light green and then the red. So this indicates that two fish probes are used simultaneously to identify and highlight two different regions of the same chromosome. And the fact that we have two chromosomes lighting up and they seem to be the similar length with the similar shape tells us that these are homologous chromosomes. If one of these bands was present at a higher frequency than two or absent, then that would indicate mutations at that level. In the early days of genetics, the current cell biology techniques had not evolved yet. Then, the limitations on staining were based on the availability of certain chemicals. One of those, and the most common at the time, was called GEMSA staining, based on the stain GEMSA. Based on the staining patterns, chromosome nomenclature in how to identify different regions of chromosomes were first evolved. So this is a legacy of the past. And what we do in when we name chromosomes is that we begin by identifying the location of the centromere. So these are five separate human chromosomes. And the centromere is indicated by the red arrow. And then the gems are staining would stain different bands of the chromosome. And then those bands were labeled from the centromere out. So number one, number two, number three, number four on the long arm, the Q arm, and the same on the other side, one, two, three, on the short arm. So here the short arm will be this side, and the long arm will be on this side. As the techniques and the microscopes became more powerful, subbands were seen, and they were subsequently identified with subnumbers. And you can see we have a hierarchy of numbering systems that are used even today.
keeping in mind that a chromosome is a single long double-stranded DNA molecule, one can then start correlating the different types of bands with different DNA conformations. So DNA conformation, i.e. the condensation state, varies along a chromosome. Some areas are highly condensed, where the DNA is wrapped around tightly to itself and proteins, and other areas have more loosely arranged DNA. The loose DNA is named euchromatin, whereas the tightly condensed DNA is named heterochromatin. There's another relationship in that in most cases when we look for genes that are actively on, they are found in euchromatin, whereas in most cases genes that are turned off are located in heterochromatin. So the state of the DNA can have an overall impact on the level of expression of a gene. During the cell cycle, when chromosomes are condensed and moved to different regions, sometimes a chromosome may end up going in an unintended direction, and that is known as non-disjunction, which leads to abnormalities in the number of chromosomes inherited by each of the daughter cells. One cell may have too many, the other cell may have too few. Non-disjunction appears to affect animal cells more severely in altering their phenotype than it does plant cells. Under normal circumstances, the number of chromosomes in the nucleus is the same for both sexes. The term ploidy refers to the chromosome complements. Ploidy is a reference to the number of sets. So haploid means one complete set of chromosomes per cell. Diploid means two complete sets of chromosomes per cell. Triploid would be three sets on and on and on. If the number is unusual, then we use the term aneuploid to indicate that. Anu means abnormal. Non-disjunction taking place during the formation of eggs and sperm can lead to aneuploid gametes, gametes with abnormal number of chromosomes. And if those gametes are then used to fertilize and produce individuals, then we'll have aneuploid zygotes. Non-disjunction can take place during any type of cell division, in mitosis or meiosis. During gamete formation, we're looking at meiosis. As you may be aware, meiosis has two phases, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. So depending on exactly when the chromosomal segregation error occurs, that mutation, it will have consequences for the resultant cells, the daughter cells. Non-disjunction in meiosis 1 results from the failure of homologous chromosomes to separate. Therefore, the gametes produced subsequently will either be the N plus 1 type or the N minus 1 type. Should these gametes then fuse with normal gametes from the other parent, then you will have conditions such as trisomic chromosomes and monosomic chromosomes. Here the offspring in trisomic would have an extra chromosome and in monosomic, they will be lacking a chromosome. Non-disjunction during meiosis 1 is shown with this figure. So the non-disjunction takes place between this step and this step, but these two chromosomes out of the set accidentally get carried into the same daughter cell. And the other daughter cell doesn't get any of these two chromosomes. Subsequently, this particular second division will have these two chromosomes also missing, if fertilization of these gametes with normal gametes takes place, the consequences depend on whether you're the top branch or the bottom branch of this non-disjunction. In the top branch, the resultant embryo will end up with three chromosomes of this type, that's trisomic. And if fertilization takes place with these gametes, then you'll have chromosome missing, that's monosomic. And recalls meiosis has a second stage and if non-disjunction occurs during the second stage, the consequences are different. The daughter cell in which the non-disjunction takes place would experience a similar addition or absence of a chromosome. The other branch that doesn't experience non-disjunction will continue as normal. That's best illustrated by a figure. So looking at figure 10.7, we see that we didn't get non-disjunction here as in the previous example, we got non-disjunction here in the second meiosis. So that will only affect these daughter cells and not these daughter cells. These will develop as normal 
and when they are fertilized by normal gametes, they will produce normal individuals, which are diploid. But in the top branch, we can see that the very top has an extra chromosome, and when that gets fertilized by a normal gamete, we have trisomic condition once more. And in the lower branch of the top division, we see that we have monosomes. Why does it matter if you have three chromosomes rather than two, or you have one chromosome rather than two? Because you still have the genes inside your nucleus. Well, the answer lies in the research performed by a number of scientists way back in the 1900s, who showed that by changing the number of chromosomes, you do affect the phenotype of the resultant organism. And those phenotypic effects are the result of something called gene dosage, a very important concept. The relative ratio between the genes has evolved over time to be static. If one set of genes is now present in extra dosage or missing because one chromosome is missing in lower dosage, that can impact its relationship in the biochemical pool with the results of other chromosomes and their genes. Therefore, you get this dosage effect to do with gene presence. Thus, aneuploidy, where chromosome number is changed, does upset dosage ratios and will alter the phenotype of the organism. But as we mentioned earlier, it doesn't seem to affect plants as much as it does animals. Those plants which are affected show a relationship to the formation of various phenotypic outcomes and their genetic complement. So these are Jimson weeds and this is the wild type where it has the right number of chromosomes. In this case, we have an extra chromosome of type A. Here we have an extra chromosome of type B, etc. And each extra chromosome has an impact on the phenotype of the seed head. Due to the fact that different genes reside on different chromosomes and they are involved with different biochemical processes, it makes sense that some chromosomes may contain genes that do not impact the biochemistry as much as other chromosomes. So duplications of those chromosomes will affect the biochemistry less than others. And that's the case with humans. So aneuploidy in humans reveals that three of the autosomes are accepted to some degree in living tissue, i.e. Uh, in babies. So we can find individuals with trisomy 13, with trisomy 18, and trisomy 21. And if you look at the numbers, these are the smaller chromosomes in the human complement. None of the larger chromosomes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., would be able to exist because of dosage effects of those genes. On the flip side, no human autosomal monosomies are ever observed in living individuals. So it seems that our bodies can tolerate a small extra dose from chromosomes 13, 18, and 21, but they cannot handle any missing chromosomes because in those cases, the dosage ratios will be upset in the negative fashion, and that leads to developmental and many other types of abnormalities in the developing fetus. However, when it comes to the sex chromosomes, we do have cases of human beings that have lots of trisomies to do with the sex chromosomes, and one common monosomy to do with the X chromosome also is known. Thus, the genes on the sex chromosomes may be less important in the biochemical makeup of a organism. Table 10.2 shows the relationship between the frequencies at birth of certain human aneuploidies. Importantly, look at the frequency at birth. So the larger chromosomes they are very, very infrequent, whereas the sex chromosomes are relatively more frequent. The amazing fact is that if we take all human conceptions and then we measure how many of those lead to birth, only 49% of human conceptions result in a live birth. That means 51%, the majority, result in some type of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. The reason for half of these is to do with chromosomal abnormalities. The other half are to do with other reasons. One of the most common 
autosomal trisomies is trisomy 21, the smallest chromosome. That leads to something known as Down syndrome. I think we're all familiar with people that have Down syndrome and the fact that they have some cognitive disabilities and they may or may not have heart abnormalities depending on their particular allele complement. Unfortunately, there's a relationship that has been identified, a correlation between the age of the mother and the risk of developing a Down syndrome child. Once the mother's age begins to exceed 35 years, the risk of giving birth to a child with Down syndrome increases dramatically. We now have a better picture than a few years ago because of ongoing research. A small portion of the chromosome, chromosome 21, contains a region known as the Down syndrome critical region, the DSCR, and that's correlated with the majority of the Down syndrome symptoms. So there's two genes. There's a gene, a candidate gene called DYRK, which has a homologue in mice that produces a major change in learning. Another recently characterized gene called DSCAM, which is also present in mice and fruit flies. In those creatures, it's associated with a malformation in the heart and the nervous system. Turner syndrome is the one monosomy of the sex chromosomes that's stable in the human population. So individuals with this condition are known as XO, the O indicating the absence of the second sex chromosome. So far, the correlation seems to be due to the activity of a gene known as SHOX. Dosage compensation takes place. This gene is not inactivated. Therefore, one copy is not enough to direct normal development. We need two copies. So the haploinsufficiency is the term that geneticists used when one copy of a gene is present, and but you need two copies to have a normal outcome. So haplo means haploid, insufficiency means not enough. So this is a case of a gene that's needed in two copies in order to produce a normal female phenotype. As a fertilized egg, the zygote continues to develop. It will flourish into multiple cell populations. This massive increase in the number of cells is due to the mitotic form of cell division. And mitosis also entails the separation of chromosomes, and therefore it's privy to the non-disjunction mutation factors. The earlier in the fetus that non-disjunction takes place, the more impact on the body of that individual once they're born. Looking at Turner syndrome females, we find that 25 to 30 percent of those females are mosaic, and when we study their cells, we find that some of the cells only contain 45 chromosomes, whereas others are normal and contain 46 chromosomes. So different parts of the female's body will be impacted to different degrees. Some Turner syndrome individuals also carry extra chromosomes, and that will be three copies of the X chromosome rather than one or two. Figure 10.9 nicely illustrates that a zygote is developing normally, and then there's a point at which non-disjunction takes place in one of the daughter cells, and all her progeny subsequently will be impacted by either having too few or too many of the sex chromosomes. In future chapters, we're going to talk about some very, very well-characterized syndromes. And two of those are called Angelman syndrome and Prada-Willi syndrome. But for now, let's just put it in the context of this chapter. Occasionally, and very occasionally, uh, we have something called uniparental disomy. That happens when both the homologs, they come from one parent, and the second one doesn't contribute anything. The rarity of this particular condition is explained by the fact that you need to have two independent mutations in the mother and the father affecting the same chromosome at the same time. So we can see that some eggs may be produced that don't have enough chromosome 15. And at the same time, we need to have sperm that have two copies of chromosome 15. In that case, you can end up with either one of these two syndromes. 
I think most of us would agree that's a pretty rare and unique combination of events, but it does occur. Another pathway to uniparental disomy has been uncovered. In these cases, in one parent during gamete formation, non-disjunction of the normal type does occur, and you end up producing a gamete that has an extra chromosome. This then unites with a normal gamete from the other parent, and the initial zygote is trisomic. However, in the very early stages of mitotic division, the extra chromosome is eliminated from the developing zygote, and that results in the two chromosomes being kept coming from one parent. An alternative term used in genetics is polyploidy. Polyploidy simply means sets of chromosomes. So instead of having one extra copy of one chromosome inside a cell, you now have a complete set of chromosomes being present in excess. Two mechanisms have been studied. One is where this process results within a species, and that's called autopolyploidy, and also between different species, where it's called allopolyploidy. Within each class, many, many forms of polyploidy are possible. Let's examine a few. Autopolyploidy within a species can result from two major mechanisms. The first is meiotic non-disjunction, and the second is mitotic non-disjunction. With respect to meiotic non-disjunction, the normal condition is to produce a haploid gamete, but because of non-disjunction, we produce a diploid gamete, and that's indicated here as a diploid egg. If that egg is fertilized by a normal pollen, then we would have three sets of chromosomes inside the resultant offspring. If that egg was pollinated by a pollen that was also non-disjunctioned, then we would have four sets of chromosomes in the resultant progeny. Likewise, during mitotic recombination, which doubles the number of chromosomes, we could have a cell that has two in non-disjunction, and that will lead to one of the daughter cells containing four sets of chromosomes and the other daughter cell containing none. Further, examples of the combination of both taking place during the evolution of a species have been noted. One consequence of polyploidy that we see in plants is an increase in the size of the fruit. So here we have eight sets of chromosomes rather than the regular two and in the wild type we have two. The situation with allopolyploidy is a bit more cumbersome and requires a unique sequence of events to produce something viable in the end. Plants that are allopolyploid have come together because of cross-fertilization with a pollen or egg of a different species. And they will fall, then will carry chromosomes from two different species inside the same nucleus. In most cases, this would be the end of the line. Those chromosomes could no longer pair, and that results in infertility for that individual offspring. However, if during the life of that individual plant, it happens to have a second mutation that results in the duplication of the number of chromosomes, then it has the potential to marry those chromosomes together during homologous pairing, and then to produce a hybrid fertile offspring. Let's use a figure to illustrate this, and figure 1011 helps us. Suppose we have two different species of plant. One has 62 chromosomes, the other one has 60 chromosomes. So meiosis is supposed to give rise to 30 and 31 respectively. So everything is normal up to this point. The error happens here when the gametes of this species accidentally are fertilized by the gametes of this species. Now we have an interspecific hybrid, and it contains 61 chromosomes, the 31 from this gamete and the 30 from that gamete. These 61 chromosomes cannot separate properly during cell division. So what we need is some type of error, a second error, to take place. And this is what happens when you get chromosomal non-disjunction. 
all the chromosomes may end up in one of the daughter cells, and then that becomes the vessel for generating a new species. So here we have a doubling of the chromosomes to 122. That's an even number. Even numbers are better than odd numbers when it comes to chromosome segregation. And if meiosis ensues properly here, then we will end up with gametes that now contain 61 N chromosomes in each. And when they fertilize each other, they will restore into the new species uh, 122 uh, chromosomes. So an error happened in each of these steps, one here and one here, leading to the production of a new species of plant. Polyploidy can occur due to natural means or artificial means. Regardless, the size of the flowers and the fruit are increased in polyploids in general. The food industry makes use of the fact that hybrids that have an odd number of chromosomes normally cannot produce seeds. So this is how you produce seedless watermelons, or seedless grapes, or seedless oranges. This brings into play another term in genetics called hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor makes the offspring more resilient than the parents. We'll revisit this parameter in another chapter on population genetics. Modern wheat has a history of utilizing polyploidy and hybrid formation in its evolution. Let's turn our attention back into the chromosomes and look at how different mutations of chromosomes can impact the resultant cells. As mentioned previously in this chapter, gene dosage imbalances can produce severe abnormalities in phenotype of individuals. Whole chromosome mutations are more severe and impactful than broken pieces of chromosomes or tiny fragments of chromosomes. So the degree of the mutation will have an impact on the phenotype. In addition, if chromosome structure is reorganized, then that too will be considered a mutation and may or may not have outcomes that are consequential. Chromosomes are normally held together by the sugar phosphate backbone of the two DNA strands in the double helix. Should those two bonds break in the neighborhood, we will have a double strand DNA break. And that is also known as a chromosome breakpoint. Once these DNA ends are formed, the natural tendency is for them to try to repair. And they can either repair by going back to each other, which is good, or they can bind to other broken ends and form some kind of hybrid DNA molecule, or they will attach themselves to the terminal regions, the telomeres of chromosomes. So depending on which of these three happens and the degree to which the DNA is broken, the consequences can be appropriate. Another factor to consider is which part of the chromosome has broken. If the end of a chromosome has broken, then naturally it will consist of a telomere and the DNA within. And if that break is quite large, then it may include a lot of genes in addition to the telomere. So these terminal deletions can have consequences depending on the degree to which that region encompasses genes. Alternatively, if any chromosome break lacks a centromere, i.e. is acentric, then that fragment may be lost during cell division if it doesn't bind to something else. We have recorded cases in which one chromosome is completely normal and the other chromosome has a small deletion at one side or the other. And these are therefore called partial deletion heterozygotes. Classic example of this is the syndrome known as cry de chat or cry of the cat. And in these individuals, we have the fifth chromosome, the P arm has a segment that's missing. Individuals with this syndrome produce a distinctive cry like a cat when they're first born. Panel A demonstrates what happens if you have a double-stranded break at a particular location on a chromosome and that repair is not properly mended. That fragment will eventually be lost during subsequent cell division. The chromosome that results will be missing depending on where the break was a substantial number of genes as well as its telomere. Panel B shows an example of the cry of the cat syndrome 
where the terminal part of the small of arm of chromosome 5 is deleted. The next category of chromosomal mutations is interstitial deletions. Interstitial deletions require two separate double strand breaks in order to lose a fragment of chromosome internally. So interstitial deletions are loss of an internal portion of a chromosome after the result of two independent DNA double strand breaks. These mutations have been documented in many organisms including humans. An example is WAGA syndrome. W -A -G -R. It involves deletions in the small arm of chromosome 11 and depending on the size of those deletions it may or may not have symptoms that impact the patient. Figure 1014 illustrates this. Here's chromosome 11, here's the centromere and this will be the P arm, the small arm. And you can see these numbers indicate patients in which they are different size deletions. So in patient number one, the deletion would encompass this region. In patient number four, the deletion is slightly bigger and includes a even larger fragment of the chromosome. The comparison of the symptoms of patients with these mutations reveals that deletions one to four and deletion nine are not correlated with Wagner syndrome. Therefore, those patients do not have the syndrome. However, five through to eight do have, and that includes a region that's encompassed right here. So deletion of this region and its genes results in the syndrome. During meiosis, we're familiar with crossing over, a process by which alleles are swapped between homologous chromosomes. Well, there's a mutation that can lead to unequal crossing over. So unequal crossing over between homologs can result in a partial deletion in one homolog and a duplication in the other. When these chromosomes are transmitted to the next generation, you will find individuals that contain a normal chromosome and the duplicated chromosome. And those individuals are partial duplication heterozygotes. Likewise, the converse. The deleted chromosome could be then transmitted to future generations and that exists in cells along with a normal chromosome and those individuals are partial deletion heterozygotes. Luckily, unequal crossing over is a very rare event. It normally occurs when the replication machine encounters repetitive regions between the homologs and because of those repetitive regions there's a misalignment in the pairing of the homologous chromosomes. A classic example of this is illustrated by williams buren syndrome, where chromosome 7 has a region that contains repetitive DNA close to the PMS gene, and unequal crossing over can lead to both a functional and a non-functional region of the chromosome, as indicated in figure 1015. The accidental misalignment of these two genes leads to a outcome that affects both chromosomes. In the example given here, the first gene is looped out so that the second gene pairs with the first gene in an accidental alignment. That automatically means that the second gene on the bottom chromosome also has to loop out. And any crossover here inside the hybrid combination of genes will result in one chromosome, the bottom one here, then over to the top one there, having a hybrid gene. And the second chromosome, starting with the top one with its loop, crossing over and then going down into the second loop, will result in a chromosome that contains three genes, including a hybrid gene. So in these people that inherit this chromosome, there are no phenotypic abnormalities, but this one here leads to williams buren syndrome. The size of the deletion or duplication is important. Large duplications and deletions can be detected by general microscopy, smaller deletions called micro deletions, and smaller duplications, micro duplications, use the commonly used fish procedure, fluorescent in situ hybridization, that we spoke about earlier. The FISH technique is pretty sensitive and it can identify 
tiny regions of chromosomes that are either present or absent. So this is the wild type condition and the probes, three of them, will bind equally to these three locations. In a small deletion, then you can identify the deletion because its presence is absent. So probe B will not bind. And you can also detect duplications in the same regard because the amount of signal generated from spot B, if they're very close together, will be more intense than under the normal circumstances. In some cases, uh, when microscopic observations are made, homologous chromosome synapsing can reveal loops, and those loops indicate areas of mismatch, as indicated here. So the unpaired loop is then indicating or indicative of some type of duplication that has resulted on the top homolog and not present in the bottom homolog. Or they could indicate a deletion in the bottom homolog not present in the top homolog. Deletion mapping is a pretty powerful technique that's been used in the past to discover the locations of many genes. And that'll be a subject of another chapter. But for now, in this context, we can say that by having deletions on certain chromosomes and not on their homolog, we can reveal the presence of recessive alleles because of this pseudo-dominance effect. Imagine you have two homologs on which one carries the dominant allele and the other the recessive, and the region of the dominant allele is accidentally deleted. Therefore, only present is the recessive allele and its effects can then be determined on the phenotype. By looking at various deletions, one can then narrow down the position of a certain gene involved in a certain phenotype. In fact, deletion mapping has relied on this type of procedure and it's pretty powerful and it can narrow down the position of a gene uh, to a precise location on a chromosome. In this example, we see a Drosophila X chromosome being subjected to different types of deletion analysis. In this particular example, we have six deletions that are being studied. Each deletion has an area that's missing, indicated by the blue. And then for the condition that we're trying to determine the location of a gene, we find that only this band corresponds to the presence of the mutant phenotype. These deletions here are outside. Therefore, by looking at overlapping regions, we can narrow down the location of any gene. When chromosomes break at two different locations along their length, the segment in between can be either rejoined in the original direction or can be rejoined to the same chromosome in an upside down direction. And the upside down leads to a chromosome inversion. The genetic consequences depend on the breaks and their locations. We'll come back to that in a while. If the broken section is switched to a non-homologous chromosome, then we have something known as a chromosomal translocation. The degree to which that has an effect depends on many factors, including the gene dosage that we spoke about earlier. If those chromosomes should undergo meiotic recombinations, then that's going to complicate the way that the homologs then come together, as we'll see now. There are two questions to ask. Does the break involve a centromere? And if it does, then it's going to be a pericentric inversion. If it doesn't involve a centromere, then it's going to be a paracentric inversion. And the outcome is different depending on where the breaks take place. When these two chromosomes, the homologs, come together, then we're going to have something known as an inversion heterozygote where we have one normal and one inverted homolog. And that's indicated in the next few panels. Figure 1019 reiterates the position of the breaks. So the centromere in this case is represented in yellow. The breaks take place in section B to D, and then that segment is rejoined in an inverted fashion. So we have an inverted chromosome. And you can see A is now next to D, and B is now next to E. And when the two chromosomes come together, you'll have the A's line up, and now the B's 
and the D's and the C's are in different places. So the chromosomes will have to undergo some type of contortion to line up those DNA sections. In a pericentric inversion, the centromere is involved and the flipping of the chromosome section results in an inverted segment and that also has implications for the way that the homologous chromosomes will now line up. Let's tell you before we show you what the consequences are. The alignment of a normal chromosome with its gene in a normal order and an inverted homologue results in the formation of an inversion loop. So this is going to be the essence of what we're going to discuss in the next few minutes. And that takes place at synapses, when the homologue synapse. If crossing over occurs outside the inverted region, then the consequences are normal. There is no special outcome. The homologue and the crossed over region with the loop are just switched and the loop moves from one homologue to the other. However, crossing over within the inverted region results in duplications and deletions in the recombinant chromosomes. So there are major consequences in this case. Crossing over in a paracentric alignment results in the movement of the centromere from one homologue to the second chromosome. And that creates something known as a dicentric chromosome, a chromosome with two centromeres. And at the same time, the chromosome that lost its uh, centromere is called an acentric fragment. The acentric fragment will be lost in the cytosol of the cell. However, the dicentric chromosome will be grabbed by both of the spindle fibers and pulled to opposite sides of the spindle complex. And eventually, the strain on the chromosome will break it at a random point between the two centromeres. This is exactly what figure 1020 tries to convey. So let's put it in perspective. We have two homologues. One of them suffers uh, inversion. So the inversion will be here. And when they line up, the result is the movement of a centromere from one chromosome to the other and a fragment is generated by recombination in between that has no centromeres and that will be lost from the cell and the remaining system will have a random break when the tension is so much on this DNA double helix that it breaks at some point along its length. And in this example here, we're breaking it right here just as an example. Let's do the same analysis on a pericentric inversion. Remember, this involves a centromere. The result is that we're going to end up with both duplicated and deleted regions in both the recombinant products and the production of meiotic cells will result in two that yield two normal gametes and two that contain abnormalities. So this one will lead to a normal gamete, this one will lead to a normal gamete, these two will produce gametes that have chromosomal duplications and deletions. So let's begin here again with the scenario that we listed earlier in a previous slide. This time we have a inversion and the inversion goes from here to there. So between C and I is the inversion. The only way the homologous sister chromatids will line up is by forming a loop, an inversion loop. And suppose a crossover takes place here in the H region, then the outcome is indicated right here. And that resolves, as we just mentioned, into these four types of gametes containing these four chromosomes. Mutations involving inversion heterozygotes are not good for the evolution of a species in general, and therefore that process is suppressed to as much a degree as possible. Geneticists use the word crossover suppression to refer to this process. Incidentally, the probability of a crossover is proportional to the length of the chromosome. And therefore, if these loops are quite large, then there's a bigger chance that the crossover will take place in this region compared to other regions. And that impacts the likelihood of getting aberrant products. 
Let's look at the final category under chromosomal mutations, and this involves chromosome translocation. Translocation is defined as the breakage and movement of a chromosome part amongst non-homologous chromosomes. So it moves from, say, chromosome 6 to chromosome 9. These translocation heterozygotes need not necessarily produce any phenotypic outcomes. It depends on which genes are involved and the size of the translocation, and also the chromosomes amongst which these changes take place. Once again, these translocations may not have an impact on the genes, but when it comes to segregation of the chromosomes, they may produce some serious outcomes. There are three types of translocation. In the first, known as non-reciprocal translocation, the movement of the piece of one chromosome to another does not have a backward movement of the second chromosome into the first. So just one piece of DNA moves. In a reciprocal balanced translocation, this happens when two pieces of chromosomes switch places. And then finally, we have something, a specialized case known as Robertsonian translocations. And this happens when two chromosomes fuse. Figure 10, 22 illustrates each one of these events. So at the top, we have a non-reciprocal translocation, where part of one chromosome here is moved to another chromosome here in one direction. Then we have a balanced translocation, where both chromosomes, the bottom half of this chromosome and the top half of this chromosome, they switch places. And then finally, we have the Robertsonian chromosome translocation, where this chromosome now moves to the end of this chromosome with a tiny piece of DNA gone amiss. So we have reduced the number of chromosomes by one in a Robertsonian condition. With the case of a reciprocal balanced translocation, when those homologues come to form bivalence during synapsis, they form a weird cross-like structure, as that's the only form that can allow the chromosomes to find their counterparts. And this happens during metaphase one of meiosis. Figure 1023 indicates this. This is called a tetravalent, and you can see that the areas in red are equivalent, and the areas in blue are equivalent along these chromosomes. And the resolution depends on which pathway out of these two common ones, or this very rare one, takes place. Once the cross-like structure is formed, known as a tetravalent, there's two resolutions, depending on which way crossing over and movement of the chromosomes takes place. With alternative segregation, the two normal chromosomes that don't involve any reciprocal translocations, they move to one pole of the cell and the two mutated chromosomes move to the other. In an alternative format, uh, in adjacent one segregation, one normal and one translocated chromosome each move to each pole. And in the very rare adjacent two segregation, homologous centromeres move together to each pole of the cell. The result of alternative segregation is that the gametes formed, they contain a full set of haploid genes. Whereas in adjacent segregation, each gamete contains two copies of some genes and complete absence of others. From a genetic perspective, the translocation heterozygotes are going to be semi-sterile because only alternative segregation leads to normal gametes. Figure 1023 illustrates all three possibilities that we've discussed. If you look carefully here, you would notice that the products are these four gametes. Each one of them contains a full set of genes and therefore, based on other factors, each one should be available for fertilization and produce a viable offspring. However, if you look at the adjacent one segregation, none of these produces a full complement of genes. So they contain duplicates and deletions. And then more than likely, these will not give rise to a 
future progeny that has the full genetic complement. And adjacent 2, which is really rare, gives rise to all kinds of mistakes and errors that will make them also unviable. Robertsonian translocations have their own genetic issues. If two pairs of chromosomes fuse by way of Robertsonian translocation, then the cell would experience a reduction in two chromosomes, indicated in the standard formula as 2n minus 2. Since no information is lost during this process, this is a frequent mechanism by which related species can have difference in chromosome number. And we believe this happened between humans and chimpanzas. A second example is given here with respect to the island of Madeira off the coast of Africa and their mouse populations. The very last part of the chapter looks at chromatin organization in eukaryotic chromosomes. Growing evidence supports the fact that the structure of chromatin is paramount in proper functioning of chromosomes and their distribution during cell division. In addition, the type of chromatin that's used in different places is also going to influence gene regulation, gene expression. So a combination of factors emerges from studying chromatin structure. Eukaryotic chromatin consists of DNA and proteins in a one-to-one -one ratio. Of the protein, about half of it represents histone proteins that are positively charged, basic proteins that can bind tightly to DNA. And the remaining half of the protein associated with DNA are called non-histone proteins and they serve a number of other functions. There are five types of histone proteins, H1, H2A, H2B, H3, H4. Being intimately associated with DNA makes them highly conserved. Four of the five form the nucleosome core particles. So these are like a eight sliced pizza. They consist of two units of 2A, two units of 2B, two units of 3, and two units of 4. The amount of DNA wrapped around the core particle is calculated to be 146 base pairs, and that's also known as the core DNA. The structure forms the nucleosome core. Histone H1 plays a role in a larger structure and it's known as linker DNA. It has no role in the nucleosome core particle. Research has indicated that the assembly of these nucleosomes takes place in a particular order, and we need to learn that very quickly. So the first thing that happens is that H2A and H2B, they assemble into dimers. And at the same time, H3 and H4 also form alternative dimers inside the nucleus of a cell. Two H3, H4 dimers come together to form a tetramer. And then on top of that tetramer, the H2A, H2B dimers assemble to form the octamer. And then the DNA is wrapped around the octamer and forms a nucleosome. This reduces the length of the DNA from naked DNA to nucleosome DNA by a factor of seven. This figure illustrates the DNA in blue winding around the nucleosome core particle, which consists of histone proteins color-coded in this case. The DNA as a revision is 2 nanometers in thickness, and 146 base pairs of DNA are wrapped around the core particle. Originally, scientists saw these beads on a string, and they conjectured as to what it could be. And now we know. And the length of the linker DNA between the nucleosomes can vary because the nucleosome is a mobile device. It can spin up and down the DNA, moving the position of the DNA along the nucleosome. And here we see H1 linking the arms of the DNA into a tight spiral, therefore further reducing the compactness of the chromatin. The association of DNA and histones is further illustrated by looking at these structures from different views. The beads on a string 
formation of DNA is not normally seen under normal cellular conditions. What we do find is the 30 nanometer fiber form of DNA, and that consists of the 10 nanometer DNA wrapped into a solenoid structure, which itself has a thickness of 30 nanometers. On end, it looks like this. From the side, it looks like this. And this then makes loops along a scaffold protein structure, which represents the length of the chromosome. Thus, the 30 nanometer fiber can form loops of various lengths depending on the dynamic nature of the chromosome at that location. The average distension of these loops gives rise to something known as a 300 nanometer fiber, which is typical of many regions of an interface chromosome. With respect to interface chromosomes, that's about it. But when it comes to dividing chromosomes, mitotic chromosomes and meiotic chromosomes, the level of condensation increases further to form the 700 nanometer fiber. And that then condenses and coils around even further into loops to form the actual 1400 nanometer condensed chromatin of sister chromatids. These two photographs show DNA in two different forms. In insert A, we have a metaphase chromosome. You can see the sister chromatids and their centromeres and how closely opposed they are to each other. In panel B, we have a chromosome whose chromatin has been stripped away. We have the scaffold, which consists of non-histone proteins, and then the loops of DNA emerge from that scaffold. That photograph reveals that these chromatin loops, which can be up to 100,000 base pairs in length, are anchored to the chromosome scaffold by these non-histone proteins at sites called MARS, matrix attachment regions. Research is revealing that these loops are the starting point for further condensation made by other non-histone proteins, which assist in compactation of the DNA. In metaphase chromatin, the compactation ratio is 250-fold compared to the 300 nanometer fiber. Chromatin compactation is a necessary mechanical solution to permitting the chromosomes from being separated without getting tangled up and breaking the DNA. At other times not involving the cell cycle, i.e. during interphase, the chromatin loops are not static, they're very dynamic. And depending on their form, whether they're tightly packed or loosely packed, i.e. euchromatin and heterochromatin, they have genes that may be being expressed or not. So active transcription takes place in segments of loops that are distant from the Mars. This allows enzymes to access to that DNA and it allows their products to leave that region of the chromosome, as we discussed with chromosome territories. The larger loops have more active transcription than smaller loops because they extend further away from the Mars. A common question asked by students is what happens to nucleosomes during eukaryotic DNA replication? Recent evidence suggests a mechanism by which these nucleosomes are dismantled and then reassembled on the newly formed daughter strands. At the site of DNA replication, the nucleosomes are dismantled into single molecules, dimers and tetramers. And after the replication fork has passed, the nucleosomes are reassembled partially from old nucleosomes and partially from newly made histones. The H2A and H2B, they disassociate as dimers. So two dimers come off each nucleosome. The H3, H4 tetramers, they don't disassociate any further, but they stay as they are. Before reattaching randomly to one or the other of the sister chromatids. The H2A, H2B dimers may disassemble even further before being reassembled from both old and new histone. The lower half of this figure attempts to illustrate this relationship. 
Here we have a complete nucleosome, and as the replication machine passes through, the nucleosome is dismantled into tetramers or dimers. The dimers may even break down into individual polypeptides. Those are then picked up by the two daughter strands and reassembled around the H3, H4 core. Research with Drosophila eye color has revealed some remarkable genetic maneuvers taking place when it comes to DNA. The position effect variegation, or PEV, this gives us a clue as to how transcription ensues on chromosomes. So the level of transcriptional activity is correlated with levels of compactation, and that compactation regulates access to the DNA. So which comes first, the activity or the compactation? And it appears compactation is the driver that frees up areas of DNA for expression. In certain strains of mutant fly that Muller was investigating, he discovered that the wild-type allele that produces the red eye color is present on a particular part of the X chromosome. When that area is translocated by an inversion, the gene moves to a new location further along the chromosome, closer to the centromere. And the centromere has a large area of heterochromatin. And that heterochromatin has the potential to spread back and forth like a wave into and encompassing the gene for the red eye color, the wild type gene. In areas of the fly where the gene is not compacted, the eye is red, the facets of the eye are red. In areas where the heterochromatin has engulfed and surrounded the wild type gene, the eye facets are white because that gene is no longer expressed. It can't produce the pigment. Therefore, the eye facets go back to their default white color. So by studying these eyes of these mutant flies, these PEB flies, he was able to conclude that this is a dynamic process happening within this region. Therefore, in a wild type chromosome, the normal gene is so far away from this region of dynamic instability that it doesn't really get affected. So therefore, every facet is wild type. But this region of the chromosome does naturally vary in its condensation level in terms of heterochromatin. We believe now that there are sequences of protein attached to the sequence of DNA which prevent the migration of heterochromatin and those are called heterochromatin barriers. These experiments proved that the level of gene expression is tied to the state of chromatin. And that chromatin is important in opening up genes for transcription. By a simple change in the state, the compactation state of the chromatin, one can turn on huge areas of genes when and if necessary. And these patterns can be transmitted from that cell to the next cell even after DNA has been replicated. This corresponds to something known as cell memory. This concludes the video lecture on chapter 10. Thank you.